Hello everyone. So I, I'm George from Ireland and here I am outside Thomas Gage's house on Portland Place in London. Uh, Gage is best known for having been the last uh, British commander-in-chief in, -chief in, um, uh, in uh, America. Well, a uh, last governor of Massachusetts when it was a colony. So uh, John Hancock took over. Um, Gage was appointed governor, of course, by the king, whereas Hancock was, was, was elected. So uh, Gage was born um, in London in 1721. He was baptized at St. Um, James's Church in Westminster, which I've filmed on other occasions. Uh, he um, was from an upper class family. His father was raised to be a Viscount. Now Thomas Gage was not the eldest son, so he didn't inherit that title. Uh, the family had previously been Catholics, and the tiny Catholic minority was treated with great suspicion and animosity by most people. But Gage's father had converted to the Church of England, which, through which they could gain preferment, because Catholics, well, we suffered from legal disabilities uh, in this country at the time. Anyway, Gage, uh, he went to he went to Westminster School. His family seat was um, Furl in Sussex, as in its a uh, small town due south of, of London, where they'd been considerable landowners for centuries, and his mother was from a similar background. Anyway, at uh, Westminster Gage, he got to know John Burgoyne, who was later to be his comrade in arms. Uh, so he was not uh, academically distinguished. He decided to um, join the army, so he became an ensign, first of all. That's the lowest officer rank. He was posted in Yorkshire for some time. Uh, he, he was good at recruiting soldiers there and indeed um, in, in America. So he served in numerous campaigns. He fought against the Jacobites, 1745 to 46. Um, that, that was the war of um, uh, Austrian succession. He fought on the continent in what's now Belgium and, and Germany. Um, so he was a mediocre army officer, but having served enough years, he gained quite some promotion. Uh, he got along well with his brother officers, even though his um, drinking was very moderate and uh, a lot of them drank heavily. He didn't like to lay wages too much, a lot of them bet a great deal. He wasn't that wealthy for someone of his background. Remember, commissions were purchased then, um, but you could you could be promoted uh, w without purchasing the higher rank because they did, they did promote on merit most of the time. Uh, anyway, so he spent a very long time in North America, it's about 15 years. So uh, he was first of all in Canada during what we call the Seven Years' War. In America, it's known as the French and Indian War. So um, part of, um, of taking um, Canada from the French, obviously then it was only Quebec, really. Uh, the rest of it was not settled by uh, Europeans, but that expanded out to be what's now um, Canada. So he spoke passable French as well. So he's the first military governor there. But uh, he treated um, the French upper class there and the Catholic clergy with deep suspicion. Um, he thought that they um, would quite like to become a French colony again. Now, in that, he was not wrong. Although, when it came to the Napoleonic Wars, I don't think they did anything about it. So, um, later, he moved to what's now uh, the United States, and um, he was commander-in-chief of uh, the British Army uh, in, in what was then the 13 colonies. He spent most of his time in York City, and uh, latterly, he was sent to uh, Massachusetts. Now, it was a very delicate situation he was uh, taking over. The so-called Intolerable Acts had been passed. Uh, there'd been the Boston Tea Party the, the year before, so he had to implement these acts. This was the mission that he was given, and he endeavored to carry it out to the best of his ability. It was something that was going to really tax the finesse of even the, the wisest uh, governor, because uh, he, was, he was seen as a very capable administrator. So he was reasonably popular to begin with, but obviously necessarily uh, clashes ensued. And then he thought there might well be a revolution. An organization called the Sons of Liberty was founded, which was keeping a close eye on him, um, watching his every move. And uh, then he thought, well, there may well be a revolution, so I'm going to have to seize the gunpowder store and send troops to do that. Well, we all know about, listen, children, you will hear of the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I've heard some people say that actually Revere didn't do that or wasn't that important and it was somebody else, but Revere's name was far better for scansion, so poetic license was invoked. Anyhow, so his troops tried to seize the gunpowder. I shan't relate the well-known tale of the clash at Lexington Green and later at Concord and then the siege of Boston. And so uh, in 1775, he was no longer, as of 11th of October, he's no longer governor of Massachusetts and George III didn't appoint another one. I know he lost control of Massachusetts, but either you thought he might have appointed one anyway, um, just to try and say, well, I'm still the rightful uh, king of this area. Uh, so that was that. He pretty soon returned to uh, to London and living he lived here at Portland Place in this very handsome house. 
Now, he had his besetting sins. He promoted people just because they were related to him or their favorites of his. He married an American lady. They had um, at least one son and at least two sons and three daughters. Um, so, because of course, until the 1770s, most Americans would have viewed themselves as British as well and not seen any contradiction or thought that belonging to their individual colony mattered more than being American. So the identity was just, was just growing. And um, it became a paid place of pilgrimage for American loyalists, or Tories as they were sometimes called, uh, seeking succour from him. And he was willing to give it, but more, more than that, to lobby Parliament to uh, try to um, offer these people compensation for their lost property. And said that their, that their um, fidelity to the crown ought to be rewarded. Um, so he died here in 1787, and he's interred at the family seat at Furl. He was a Whig in politics and had indeed stood for, for Parliament without success. His father had briefly been an MP. His father had been a, a, awarded a title in relation to Ireland, even though I'm not sure his father had any connection to Ireland. And then after that, um, uh, yeah, uh, Gage died and his elder brother died childless. So Thomas Gage's son inherited that title. I'm not sure there's a Viscount Gage to this day. Right, so that's enough from me. Toodaloo.